Call of Duty has often distorted and played with history and the upcoming Call of Duty Vanguard seems to be no exception. That begs the question, has it always been like this? Was Call of Duty more accurate back in the day? Let's take a look at the real and the fake history of Call of Duty 1. In 1943, it was decided that the Allied would invade Europe the following year. Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan, who had been appointed as the Chief of Staff to the Supreme Allied Commander, had at that time already been coordinating structural plans for such an invasion. Operation Overlord would be a landing in Normandy. The invasion would consist of five infantry divisions. Two American, two British and one Canadian. These would assault beaches codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. In addition to the beach landing, two American airborne divisions and one British division would airdrop behind the assault area. More than 23,000 Allied troops participated in the invasion. They were to capture strategic points such as artillery and railroads that the Germans could otherwise use in the fight on the beaches. In Call of Duty 1, you play as one of these paratroopers and as depicted in the game, these airdrops did not go according to plan. Anti-aircraft fire caused formations to split up and paratroopers would often miss their drop zones, forcing them to walk for many kilometers to link up with their unit. The sign and countersign were respectively flash and thunder, as it was believed that Germans would have a hard time pronouncing these words. Some unfortunate soldiers dropped on German positions and were shot down while others would land and drown in rivers because their parachute got caught in it. Others got caught in trees. This was mostly a problem for the Americans as British paratroopers had a quick release system on their parachutes. Mines were also a concern. Paratroopers that landed on fields with grazing cows were calmed, knowing that the area wouldn't be full of mines. This dispersed and chaotic drop did however have the side effect of confusing the Germans, making them unable to determine what the target of the operation was. In the game, you quickly make your way to the town of St. Mare Eglise. This was the first town to be liberated during D-Day. A paratrooper by the name of John Steele got caught in the church spire and was hanging from it helplessly for hours, forced to watch the fighting below. He survived and has been immortalized by a mannequin and parachute hanging from the tower today. Germans fired on Utah Beach using 105mm guns placed outside Breakaw Manor. Two officers and 11 men were tasked with silencing the guns. All guns were successfully destroyed in the assault, but something that was possibly even more important occurred during this assault. At the third gun, Officer Richard Winters discovered several maps detailing the exact placements of guns, mines and wire on the Utah Beach. This assault is also portrayed in the HBO limited series Band of Brothers. Okay, Martin, we're about ready to ram the gate with less than 10 minutes from your first shot to pull this off. If take any longer, they'll be sending someone to rescue us. You take out the front guards, concentrating on the machine gun nests. Once the gate is down, get in there and find the Major. Then rendezvous back at the truck. It's unclear what exact POW camp is portrayed in Call of Duty 1 and if it even is based on a specific real camp. The designation given is 3A, but that refers to a permanent camp near Berlin, while the camp in the game is a transit camp located in Austria near Strasov. Nonetheless, the Germans did have so-called Dulats, which were transit camps for POWs. The purpose was to extract information from prisoners before they were sent to a permanent camp, a Stalag. Prisoners could be held in solitary confinement for up to a month while they were interrogated. One particularly gruesome example of how bad conditions in a Dulag could be is Dulag 205. And before I tell you about Dulag 205, I would like to warn you that some of the details I'm about to share are very graphic in nature. If you'd like to skip this part, fast forward to the next video chapter. 
In Dulag 205, Soviet POWs, mostly from Stalingrad, were starved, forcing them to eat the corpses of their fellow prisoners. Hearts, livers and brains are just some of the organs that prisoners would remove from corpses for consumption. The transit camp suffered from overcrowding, and water obtained from melted snow during the winter became too dangerous to drink, as it was contaminated by urine and human excrement. Dulag 205 was liberated in 1943 by the Red Army. British paratroopers from the 6th Airborne Division were tasked with securing the left flank of the invasion. As the game accurately depicts, the paratroopers were to secure the bridges crossing Orn River and Cane Canal. The paratroopers landing at the bridges had fewer problems landing on target when compared to their American counterparts. They landed successfully at their landing zones and the bridges were in control of the Allies within 10 minutes, with just the loss of two soldiers. The bridge depicted in the game is likely the Cane Canal Bridge, which was later named Pegasus Bridge after the insignia of the 6th Airborne Division. German soldiers constantly attacked areas around the bridge, but, just like in the game, the bridge was successful in holding the bridge. Judging from pictures of the bridge, the recreation in-game seems quite accurate, despite the older graphics of Call of Duty 1. Today the bridge functions as a museum commemorating the liberation. These are the locations of the major hydroelectric dams in the Ruhr industrial region of Germany. Their main purpose is to provide electrical power to the factories and cities throughout the area. Last year, a clever fellow by the name of Dr. Barnes Wallace created an odd sort of bomb that was specially designed to breach these dams. Using these bombs, the dam busters from 617 Squadron successfully breached the Mona and Eder dams, causing extensive flooding and damage to the industrial heart of Germany. The bad news is the bastards have already repaired the damage done, and Bomber Command wants to have another crack at these targets. What do you do if you want to destroy a dam defended by nets in the water around it and anti-aircraft to defend it from bombers? It was exactly this question that the British Royal Air Force had been pondering from 1937 to 1942. The solution was a skipping bomb that, like a stone, would skip across the surface of the water instead of being submerged and inevitably be caught in a net. When it hit the dam, it would sink and detonate after reaching a depth of 9 meters or 30 feet. On the night of the 16th of May 1943, Operation Chastise went ahead. 19 Lancasters used the bouncing bomb to attack three dams deemed crucial to the German war effort. Two of the dams, the Ida and Möhne, were destroyed while the third, Skorpe, withstood the attack. Only 11 out of the 19 Lancasters returned. 53 members of the British Royal Air Force were killed and three were taken to POW camps. It's estimated that between 1,200 and 1,600 civilians died as a result of the flooding. An entire movie could be made about the attack and in fact in 1955 The Dam Busters premiered depicting the planning and execution of Operation Chastise. Call of Duty shows none of this. It's set months after the operation and depicts a fictional attack on a newly rebuilt Eder Dam. In real life, all dams were rebuilt in a matter of months. Just like the level for Eder Dam, the level for Battleship Tear Pits depicts a real historical entity, but not the actual event the entity is known for. Instead, the events of the level are fictional, and this time the level is set before the historical event of note. In the game, you're infiltrating Tear Pits with the objective of securing vital war documents and weakening the ship in preparation for a pending RAF bombing. Such an infiltration never took place. The RAF bombing did. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we talk about the bombing of the tear pits, let's talk about what made the tear pits special. The battleship was massive with a length of 251 meters or 823 feet, and a crew of more than 2,000 occupied the ship. Winston Churchill called it the beast. Throughout the war, the British would attack the tear pits multiple times, but it would often escape with little harm done to it. The ship spent most of its time in the waters outside of Norway, where it acted as a deterrent. The British were intent on sinking the tear pits and although many attacks on it had failed, they had successfully damaged it in multiple operations. 
and in Operation Obviate, the rudder and one of the propeller shafts were damaged, making it unable to move on its own. Then, on Sunday the 12th of November 1944, the Tirpitz, docked outside of Tromsø, was attacked by the RAF one final time, and none other than number 617 squadron, the Dam Busters, were the ones attacking it, in addition to number 9 squadron. In one and a half minutes, they dropped 28 Tallboy bombs over the ship. Two or three of the bombs hit it directly, while the missiles were so powerful that they also caused damage. The head of the local Red Cross was out bicycling when the attack happened and noticed that shrapnel from bursting shells had littered the ground. The Tirpitz was no more. What's incredible is that the presence of the Tirpitz can still be felt to this day. Pieces of the ship can be found on the shores near where it sank, and in 2019, a scientific study of more than 200 trees that were in the vicinity of the tear pits showed that they had been damaged by the artificial smoke that the tear pits had used to conceal itself. That damage resulted in strong growth decline in 1945, and for some trees, their growth was unusual for up to 9 years. Trees up to 4 kilometers away, or 2.5 miles, were affected, showing just how much environmental impact the tear pits had. Hearing some city names often surface pictures in our minds. If I say Tokyo, you're probably seeing cramped streets and busy intersections enveloped in numerous glowing square signs advertising a cacophony of products and services. If I say San Francisco, you might see the Golden Gate Bridge or the hills that the city is built upon. But if I say Stalingrad, you probably don't see much of anything. But you likely do know of it. Stalingrad is a city not tied to a certain landscape, a landmark or a feeling. Stalingrad is tied to history. It's September 1942. The Germans are attacking the industrial city of Stalingrad. The city was supplying the Soviet war effort, so it had some tactical value, but it also bore the name of the leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin. It was thought to be a major embarrassment to the Soviet Union if this city were to fall into German hands. The in-game loading screen to the Stalingrad level mentions an order 227. This order was real and was issued on the 28th of July. It ordered that the army were not to take a single step back. Soldiers that abandoned positions without orders from higher up were to be killed on the spot. Civilians were also refused evacuation from Stalingrad, with Stalin claiming that the army would fight harder, knowing that the city was full of civilians. General Tchaikov had ordered troops into small units that were to get very close to German soldiers, forcing the Germans to stop using artillery, as it would put their own soldiers at risk. This resulted in brutal close combat. Soldiers didn't last long, and they would often be killed or wounded within 24 hours of entering the city. The entire battle for Stalingrad lasted months, starting in July 1942 and ending in February the following year. The Germans were halted by the arrival of the Soviet winter. They didn't have a sufficient amount of supplies, which gave the Soviets a window to retake the occupied parts of the city. But what really set the Germans back was a Soviet pincer maneuver that had trapped 300,000 Axis soldiers in Stalingrad. On January 31st, General Friedrich Paulus would surrender in opposition to Hitler's order to fight the very last man. The night before the 31st, Hitler had promoted Paulus to field marshal. His surrender the next day was the first time in the history of Germany's armed forces that a field marshal had surrendered. This was the beginning of the Soviet counterattack on Germany, which would ultimately culminate in the fall of Berlin. One thing of note is that Call of Duty does play up the disposability of Soviet soldiers. There is, for example, no reason to believe that some soldiers were only handed ammo as they headed into the city. It's believed that around 800,000 Axis soldiers were killed, wounded, missing or captured, while the Soviets had 1.1 million dead, wounded, missing or captured soldiers. Estimates put the civilian death toll at around 40,000. In 1961, the city was renamed Volgograd as part of the de-Stalinization scheme by the then Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev.
The story of the liberation of Warsaw begins a bit before the events depicted in the game. In the summer of 1944, it was clear that the Red Army was approaching Warsaw, and in anticipation of this, the Polish underground known as the Home Army staged an uprising meant to assume control of Warsaw before the arrival of the Soviets. They hoped that this would allow them to make their own anti-communist government in exile with the help of the Allies after the war. The Soviets themselves encouraged this uprising and promised aid to the Home Army. 50,000 Home Army troops attacked the German forces occupying the city and actually gained control of the majority of the city within just three days. But the Germans sent reinforcements and bombarded the Home Army the following two months. The Soviets didn't deliver the promised aid and actively blocked Western allies in using Soviet airbases to deliver supplies to the Home Army. On October 2, 1944, the Home Army surrendered to the Germans. After this, the Germans deported the entirety of the city's population and started destroying the city. In what can only be described as needless cruelty, the Germans consulted academics on which structures had the most cultural value for the Polish people. Destruction of these structures were prioritized. On January 17, 1945, Soviet soldiers crossed the Vistula and entered Warsaw. It was a ghost city. Germans had spent the last four months destroying the city and building defensive bunkers in the anticipation of the Red Army. The city was captured in a matter of hours and the German forces offered little resistance. Most of the fighting took place at the main railway station. This wasn't much of a liberation, however. The population was at this point 153,000, down from 1.3 million. The few civilians that had avoided deportation by the Germans witnessed the change from one dictatorship to another. As soon as September 1944, the NKVD, or the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, had set up a headquarters with a prison and a torture chamber in Warsaw. I'm not going to spend time on the following two levels, Festung Rekogne and V2 Rocket Side, as they don't pertain to a specific event. I will quickly note that I'm unable to find evidence for British on foot soldiers destroying V2 rockets with hand placed explosives and that the entire scenario seems unlikely. Fortress Rekogne is also fictional. The Soviets entered Berlin on the 16th of April 1945. 1.5 million troops attacked the capital defended by just 95,000 German troops. These German troops were poorly trained and poorly armed. The citizens' militia consisting of the old and unfit and the Hitler youth were also among the defenders of the city. By the 23rd of April, the city was surrounded and on the 30th of April, Hitler killed himself. It's believed that the red flag was hoisted above the Reichstag on the 30th of April, although fighting would continue in the building on the 1st of May, and would finally calm down in the afternoon. This date should however be treated with caution, as the Soviets were obsessed with taking the building by the 1st of May, as the 1st of May is International Workers' Day. There's an iconic photo of the hoisting of the flag that was actually a reenactment of the actual hoisting, On May 2nd, the city was unusually calm. Shots from SS soldiers committing suicide would occasionally ring out. Berlin had fallen. 78,291 Soviet soldiers were killed and 274,184 were wounded. The war in Europe ended on the 8th of May and the city of Berlin was in ruins. Some Soviet troops supported the displaced civilians with bread and other essentials, but some troops committed war atrocities. Thousands of civilian women in Berlin were raped. One number that's derived from medical records is 100,000 women raped, but it's not an exact figure. History is often portrayed as events that can be neatly boxed up and summarized, but it doesn't quite work like that in real life. The war wasn't over, and in August America dropped two nukes over Japan. Europe was divided up in East and West, and the seeds for the Cold War were sown, which would blossom into an existential fright gripping everyone, be they Russian, American, Danish, British, or German, or anyone else for that matter. The Cold War may be over, but the conflict lives on. 
Call of Duty 1 is heavily based on the real-life events of World War II, but it definitely plays with the events. As far as I can tell, there was no on-foot attack on either dam borne out by a single person, no Soviet soldiers at Stalingrad that were only issued ammo, and no covert infiltration of battleship tear pits. As such, Call of Duty 1 may not be the 100% accurate, it was bigger back in the day kind of game that you may remember it as. But it's still based on historical events and the decisions taken by the dev team has resulted in some very entertaining levels. And most important of all, it doesn't seem as if there's been arbitrary changes in the nationality of war heroes or the shifting of blame for war crimes. Each event described in this video could fill multiple books and indeed many books have been written about them, so I hope the video has sparked your curiosity for the real history Call of Duty is based on. On that note, it'll be interesting to see just how accurate the upcoming Call of Duty Vanguard will be. That's it for this video, however. If you're new here, welcome to Worldview. I make videos about virtual worlds and their connection to ours. I'm currently working on a video about how Dishonored 2 expertly portrays the divide between poverty and wealth. I'm also working on a video about how Assassin's Creed Valhalla portrays Vikings and perhaps more importantly, what it leaves out in its portrayal. Lastly, I'm continuing my journey through history with a video about Call of Duty 2. If you want more videos in that vein, consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps a lot.